Good morning everybody and welcome to this next instalment in the Royal Marines Band Services Instagram uh, Masterclass Series. My name is Lance Corporal uh, Sophie Perriam and uh, today I'll be taking you through just a masterclass um, to do with developing a classical clarinet sound. Um, I'll be giving you some exercises that I use in my practice routine and hopefully you'll be able to put them into your own routine. Um, and then I'll hopefully be able to answer any questions that you might have through the, through the, um, through the post, through the page. Um, so let's get going. Um, so just give you a little bit of kind of info about me really and where I've come from and how I uh, joined the band service. Oh, excuse me, service. Um, so I was about 12 when I started playing the clarinet. Um, I just started year seven in, in comprehensive school. Um, was really enjoying it and then uh, my uh, clarinet teacher gave me um, a tenor saxophone to try out a couple of years later. Um, and I really loved the tenor saxophone, that was amazing. Um, and then a couple of years after that, I started to learn the flute as well. So by the time I was 18, I'd got on with grades um, on all three instruments and really thought, you know, ma making a um, kind of um, a living out of being a musician was really appealing to me. Um, so when I left school, I uh, was very fortunate that I accepted a place to join uh, the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama in, in Cardiff, which is a specialist music conservatoire. Um, and I studied classical saxophone there for four years and it was, it was amazing, I learned so much while I was there. Um, didn't really play a lot of clarinet to be honest with you, um, it was just doing, doing a couple of shows here and there, playing in pit orchestras, that kind of stuff. Um, life after college was, was, was good for a couple of years, um, I thought I really want to make it as a professional musician so I started teaching a little bit. Um, was also it playing in show bands, playing in big bands, um, and then playing in pit orchestras as well. Um, I did that for a couple of years, really enjoyed it, and then found that um, I wanted a bit more, I wanted a bit more from a playing. Um, I always knew about the band service, um, or I say always knew, it was from about um, year 10, so GCSE level, that I'd heard of the band service. And thought, you know what, I'm gonna go for this. Um, and I joined. I auditioned, um, wanting to be a saxophone player. God, there's loads of people waving and, and joining. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, wanted to audition as, as, a, as a saxophone player. Um, and instead I was offered um, a clarinet, which was fine, totally fine. Um, and I now get the chance to play both solo clarinet and saxophone um, in respective bands. So I, I, I get um, a good, good deal out of the job at the minute. So what have I done since joining? I was relatively quick in, in training. Um, I passed out of the Royal Marines School of Music within 11 months. Um, it was a lot of hard work. I just wanted to be in a band as quick as I could. Um, but during my time, I won the Royal Marines Young Musician of the Year Award, the Castle Prize. I won that on saxophone, not on clarinet. Um, and then I joined a band um, after passing out. Um, I went to Pompey Band for Portsmouth Band for a couple of months before I joined uh, Plymouth Band and I had a fantastic four years there. I got to travel loads of places. Um, I went to India, I got to play under India Gate with the, uh, the, the Navy Band which was, was amazing. Um, I also went to Romania, I got the chance to play a uh, clarinet solo on one of their stages. Um, I've been to Abu Dhabi and Dubai a couple of times, um, been to Belgium, uh, been part of the Passchendaele Remembrance where it was Tri-Service Orchestra, getting to work with the likes of uh, Dame Helen Mirren and Alfie Bow, that was amazing. Um, and yeah, it's just been, been brilliant, but probably my best kind of gig to date has been the chance to perform at the uh, Royal Albert Hall. And I was very thankful a couple of years ago to have been offered um, a saxophone solo, the chance to play a saxophone solo. Um, and it was probably the best, the best couple of days of my life to be doing that. And uh, I hope to do it again really soon. Um, what else have I done in the job? So last year I completed a master's. So I obviously joined with a, um, with a degree and then really wanted to kind of further my education again. Um, so I was, I was led to believe that um, on my audition that they, they, uh, the Masters was, was in the process of being, being developed. And yeah, thankfully, last year I actually completed it and it was um, very, very, very... Um, what's the word? can't even think what the word is. It was very rewarding. 
uh, uh, to be able to get my saxophone out again and to be able to be playing at such a high level. So it was fantastic. And it was all um, partially funded by the band service as well. Um, I also play a lot of sport. Um, I'm a keen golfer, a keen uh, badminton player, um, and I've had some fantastic opportunities to travel the world with doing those representative sports as well. So I've been to South Africa. Um, the list is endless, really. So let's have a couple of hellos. Hello to Josie Parrott. Hello, Drago Sachs. Armed Forces Bands UK. Hello, nice thumbs up there. Uh, loads of people joining. Super Swim underscore Freya. Hello. Brilliant. It's nice to see so many of you joining us today. So what do we hope to cover in this masterclass? We're going to talk about what we associate with a really good clarinet sound. Um, we're going to talk about influences of players and how they can help you develop your own sound. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on embouchure, but we're not going to go into depth in embouchure. Um, what I really want to focus on in this masterclass is being aware of our ear stream and our tongue position and how important they are in developing um, a good clarinet tone. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of exercises as well. So we're going to look at tongue and ear stream exercises, a bit of tone matching, um, and also some slow, slow scales as well. And then we're going to see how that all relates into... Um, into orchestral excerpts and repertoire as well and how that all relates in. So what do we associate with a good sound? For me, it's focused, it's clean, it's got a really clear kind of sound to it. It's very even in the registers. It's very rich and warm, um, very deep, and it has this resonance about it that carries to the back of the room. So if you're listening in an orchestra, you can hear the clarinet player from the back of the room because they've just got this sound that just manages to fill the whole hall. So yeah, they're, they're kind of the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight things that I think make a really, really good sound. Now for me, when I joined the School of Music, it was important that I went away and listened to um, clarinet players. Now I'd also been to, been to music college, so I knew what a good clarinet sound could sound like, um, but for me it was important for me to go and develop my own. And I did that by listening to loads of different players and what I want you to do is, I want you to go away and get listening to different clarinet players first and write down what you like about their sounds. What you like about their playing style, do they play with vibrato? Is that something you want to do in your, with your clarinet sound? So I was listening to players and for me the two players that really stuck out to me were Martin Frost, who is, I think we can all agree, an amazing clarinet player. He's just got such a prowess with the instrument and is in such control of it. Um, it's fascinating to watch him play. And also Corrado Giafredi. Now he's got a very, very active live, uh, sorry, Instagram uh, page. So if you guys want to check him out, Corrado Giafredi, an amazing, amazing clarinet player. And these are the guys that I wanted to emulate. Not necessarily be a carbon copy of them, but emulate them. And I did that by yeah, writing down um, different things I liked about their sounds. So I liked the fact that Corrado played with a very big, open, round sound. And I really wanted to emulate that. Uh, let's have a look at some... Questions. What brand? Uh, what's that? Saxy lady. Hello. What brand and model is your clarinet? The bell and barrel are really cool. Okay, great question. So this is um, a bakun. So somebody else's looks like a bakun. Yes, nine two four nine two nine four dot l dot a dot music. It is a bakun. Um, it's a model F, um, which is a fantastic clarinet. I originally joined playing a buffet R thirteen prestige, which I really really loved. Um, but I've read so many good things about Bakun's and how well they played and it seemed like a lot of professional players were playing them. Um, that yeah, I just asked the band service really nicely if I could have one and uh, they, they, they were amazing when I bought me one. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, a Model F um, with a stock, stock bell. Um, it's my own barrel, which is a, a fat boy barrel and that helps me create quite a big sound, quite a broad sound. Um, I've noticed that um, since changing over to clarinet, I struggle projecting a little bit, so this just allows me to, to make a nice big sound. Any other questions? Uh, what genres, uh, genres do you listen to personally? Great question, Amy Um I listen to a lot of music. Um, I'm quite eclectic, so I can listen to house music one day. I quite like listening to disco. Um, and then I can put on a flute sonata and quite happily listen to that. So. Um, I think if you want to be a well-rounded musician, you've just got to get out there and listen to as much music as you can. 
Uh, my master's on saxophone um, was to do with uh, extended techniques on the instrument, so a lot of the time I wasn't really playing music. Um, but I think that by listening to loads of music, it helped me be able to find the music um, within something that doesn't really have a tune, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, get out there and listen to as many different types of music as you can. So we're moving on. So when we talk about the onshore, it's the mission control, isn't it? And that's what kind of influences our sound, our control, response, intonation, all that kind of stuff. I'm not here to, to tell you that this is the right way to, um, to, to hold the mouthpiece uh, in your mouth. I'm not here to do any of that because I'm a firm believer that if it works, don't change it. So if, if what you're doing with your embouchure lets you play in tune, um, lets you have a good response and a good control, then please don't change it. But basically the, the function of it is, is to seal the air, isn't it? And, to, and it serves as a cushion, I guess, to control the reed. And we should never be pinching. Um, when I think of when my embouchure um, goes onto the mouthpiece, I'm gently hugging it, basically. And what I want to touch on, first of all, is um, airstream and tongue position. Now these are really, really important um, when we uh, uh, start to talk about clarinet tone and how we develop that tone. So when we talk about uh, when we talk about airspeed, sorry, um, we should be wanting to produce a fast and cold airstream not a warm and slow airstream. And I want you guys, you don't need clarinets for now. Um, if, you, if you have already, haven't got them out, don't worry about it. We just need your hand. And what I want you to do is I want you to say the word ha, ha, and blow the air onto your, onto your hand. Ha, ha. The air is really warm and it's really slow. And if you notice our tongue position, it's really low in our mouth. Ha. Ha. Not good for clarinet playing. What we need is a faster and colder airstream. And this helps us yeah, create the best kind of sound for this instrument. And the way we do that is by saying the word he or going shh, shh. And when I do that, I notice that my tongue suddenly goes really high. It goes to the back of my teeth. So shh, um, it's at the back of my molars. Um, and the air is obviously coming out a lot faster and a lot colder. And there's um, an exercise that we can use to check on our tongue position. Um, and what I want you to do, guys, in your practice routine um, is basically just finger um, a C. So it's just your F with the register key on. Um, it's a really flexible note on the instrument, which means we can do quite a lot with it. And it's around kind of this area where we notice, where we can notice um, tonal changes and intonation issues on the instrument. Excuse me while I put my uh, tooth guard in. Unfortunately, my bottom teeth are very, uh, very sharp, so I have to wear a mouth guard to protect my bottom lip. I'm going to play you a C, just a plain C, and hopefully uh, in the position where I want my tongue to be, which is high, and I want to be using fast air. From, from intonation that much um, and that's because I've got a fast A stream and a high tongue position. Now listen to what happens to the pitch when I lower my tongue position. remember it is fast cold air and a high tongue position and I'll put that into a scale so I'll just play a C major scale normally with a high tongue position and a fast air stream and then I'll play one opposite I'll play one with a slower air stream and a lower tongue position and listen to hopefully you'll be able to pick it up on, on, on the feed listen to the difference in the sound and listen to the difference in the intonation as well and the pitch so this is normal Stuff, 
which is which is always a good thing. Now I'll play it using a lower tongue and a slower air speed. And this all I've done is I've changed two, two things. I've made sure that my tongue is staying quite high and I've made sure that the ear string is staying quite fast. Now, contrary to belief um, on the clarinet, uh, the tongue position doesn't change that much. Um, it's only when we're kind of getting into the extremes of the higher edge, so where um, our tongue position and throat shape might slightly change. But for the majority of the time, when I play the clarinet, my tongue position stays in the same position, which is hopefully high and delivering a faster ear string. So give that a go guys, um, if you want to uh, do a hashtag of yourself doing it, see how low you can get, especially on that C, it, it can drop really, really low, um, hashtag RMBS Masterclass, and I'll have a listen and see, and see how they sound, and see if, see if playing with a higher tongue position and a faster issue, see if that makes a difference. Let's take a couple of questions, because um, there's loads that are coming in. Uh... Are there any good jazz clarinet musicians you like? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not really a jazzer. I, I, like I said, I play classical saxophone um, and I prefer to play classically on, on, on the clarinet. Um, it's a diff whole different art form. But uh, just listening to Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, um, they're always really good. Eddie Daniels, fantastic player. He did an amazing uh, version of um, Solfagetta Metamorphosis. Um, which is amazing. If you get a chance to listen to it, YouTube it, it is it is amazing. Um, yeah, it's a whole different ball game. But I, I do listen to them. But um, it, that's that's another side of the job of of the clarinet that um, I'm not very good at at the minute. <laughs> uh, what read you play on or recommend for sax and clarinet, Josie Parrot? Um, so I usually play, it depends obviously on your setup, um, I play on an, an, just an M30 Van Doren mouthpiece and I've got um, a silver steam ligature. Um, I play on Van Doren V12s or I might play on Diodario um, 3.5s and, and that's both on saxophone and clarinet. I find that they're, they're really, really easy to play on um, and they just give me the sound that I kind of want. Um, but yeah, if you're looking to change reads, just go out there and try different different brands. Um, there's there's so many out there um, other than your Van Doren's and uh, so yeah, get out there. The Dario are really good. Do you? Oh, that's a great question, Alexandra underscore MCB. Do you enjoy slap tonguing on the sax? It's so fun. Yes. Anything where I can make my instrument sound like it's not an instrument it is a big plus for me. That was my whole master's recital. My whole master's was based on stuff like that. So yes, extended techniques, a big thumbs up. And we'll go with one more question. Uh, Vicky Osborne, 24. Should the tongue position be the same when playing saxophone? Ah, um, so on saxophone for me, it's slightly different. Um, it, I kind of play with a more relaxed tongue um, and then it kind of changes as I go through the registers in the instrument. Um, that's kind of a bit of a grey area really, but uh, I think there's more ply um, when you play a, play a saxophone. If you think when you play a clarinet, when you hit the note, it seems to hit quite high. Um, you can't really make the note that sharp, um, you can make it really flat. Um, and I think that's to do with tongue position and the air stream. Whereas on saxophone, the note seems to hit in the middle, so you can play a bit sharper or a bit flatter, um, depending on your tongue position and the air speed. So there's a bit of play when, when you play saxophone. But for me, um, I play one with, which is quite um, in the middle of my mouth rather than too low or too high. And then I can adjust either way then. Okay, so we move on. Tone matching. So when we hear those kind of great clarinet players, they seem to just be able to play in a register um, and you, you don't know which register they're playing in, they just seem to have such control over the instrument. And I'd say they've done that through tone matching exercises. So when you're playing a note, it sounds like every other note on the instrument, which is what I do we want to do as a clarinet player. And what, that's what I want to do. I don't want people to know 
to kind of realise what, what note I'm playing. I, I like that idea of them thinking, oh, well, it could be that note, but oh, it also could be that note as well. Um, just because they can't tell because it all sounds exactly the same. So what I want you to do, I want you to find a note on your instrument. Um, so for me, it's my Fs. Find notes that you really like the sound of. So for me, like I said, it's an F uh, in the clarion register and an F in the old shallow row. Um, so I'll just play you the F in the clarion first. playing my instrument and then in the lower register it's kind of the same again it's got a nice little roundness to it it's a bit sweeter um, and then once you find the notes it can be any note whichever note really kind of sits in your ear really well um, Work around it chromatically, so really trying to tone match, so really paying attention to where your tongue position is and how fast your ear stream is, and really paying attention um, and always referring back to that favourite note, if you like. So for me, like I said, it's the F. So I'll just work cr chromatically around it, always referencing back to it. And then I'm trying to basically just make all, the all my notes sound like my favourite note. Something like this. then wasn't it it's a notorious note on the instrument anyway um, so I've really got to work hard trying to make sure that that tone matches my F so I'm gonna try that again So usually you find there's notes that just naturally sit a bit brighter um, than, than, than others and you've just got to work a little bit harder when, you, when, you, when you're trying to kind of tone match those notes. Um, listen to your intonation too as well. This instrument is in tune as it is, but as soon as I start playing it, it goes out of tune. Um, so really pay, put, put, in, uh, put a tuner on if you've got one um, and really, really, really be really methodical when you're tone matching and when you're paying attention to intonation. Um, ways you can progress that so once you get really once you think you've kind of um, tone matched all the notes on your instrument I'm just going to pop my iPad up in a minute in two seconds um, you can go on to um, 12th exercises which are then really good because you're talking bigger jumps on the instrument uh, the clarinet overblows is 12th and all you're going to be doing is playing a note and putting the register key on and really paying attention to, once again, tongue position, ear string, and you're trying not to have any bumps or any bends when you're playing the notes. And you're trying to match the tones. So I'll just play, I'll play an F, I'll put my register key on and get a C. <laughs> So we're making them really legato, try not to have any bumps or accents um, while you're making your way through the instrument. Once you've kind of established your sound and you've got a good control of it, suddenly everything else becomes really easy um, because there's one less thing you have to worry about. So you can relax and you can just play your instrument and it, it's a fantastic feeling when it, when it happens. Uh, any questions? Any more questions? Oh, hello, Bonnie Deathridge. Is that, Deathridge, is that how you say your name? Hello from the Rom Song Clarinet section. Hello. Uh, what 
what's your favorite technique? Oh, Alexander, you've asked me a question again. Is that saxophone? Um, on saxophone, I love playing multiphonics. I think they're great. Um, when you can just make, make your instrument sound like it's squawking, I think that's really fun. Um, I'm not very good on the clarinet doing them. Um, it's a little bit different, but yeah, definitely any multiphonics, any, any glissandos, anything like that, that they're great. So let's go on to slow scales. Now everyone hates slow scales and slow practice because it's the worst thing that somebody set tells you when you want to work on sound, oh, just practice long tones. Yep, they're really good, obviously for obvious reasons. But what we want to try and do then is try and incorporate those long tones into scales. So I've got a little exercise for you guys to try out. Um, basically, we're going to just play a one octave scale. So we're just going to go up. So I want you to pick a scale that you really like the sound of, or you find quite easy to play. Or if you fancy a challenge, then go for it. Um, and the idea is to play that one octave scale up, have four beats off and play it back down. But we're trying to play it as slow as we can. And what that will do, um, so, so what that will kind of help us do, it'll um, help us be aware of our tongue position, our ear stream, the evenness of the sound we're trying to make. Um, it just gives our brain that little bit of extra time to kind of catch up with what we're doing and ingrain really good practice uh, routines into our routine, if you like. Um, so the idea is to play the scale as slow as you can, um, almost to the point where it's difficult to finish the octave comfortably, okay? So every, every note of the scale is worth four beats. So we're going to play semi-briefs. So I've got my metronome. It's, it's a bit broken. Um, it's held together with tape at the minute. Um, so hopefully it'll work. Um, and I just got it on crotchet equals 100. And the idea is to play a semi-brief um, note for every, of, of the scale. And I'm going to try and get to the top of the scale paying particular attention to my tongue position, A stream, and my technique. And if I make a mistake, I go back to the beginning. So let's give it a go. put that on stop for a second it's quite a nice scale because we've obviously got g sharps and d sharps and they're quite difficult uh, to get the coordination correctly and now we'll go back down oh missed the note there didn't i so let's do it again to work and really trying to push all the air out of my out of my lungs to get to the end of that scale let's put a little challenge in so again use the hashtag rmbs uh, masterclass um, put your metronomes on and see how slowly and how nicely you can play a scale that's the challenge so mine was a crotchet equals 100 i'm sure a lot of you can play a lot a lot slower than that and a lot better than that um, no circular breathing if any of you can do it that's cheating <laughs> um, once you've kind of, uh, so yeah, so then you want to try and work your way through different scales as you're doing that. Um, so yeah, just working your way all the way up the instrument. Again, trying to remain, uh, keep, keep a good high tongue position, a fast ear stream, and a really, really good technique. And trying to play it all in tune as well. Um, once you get comfortable doing all that, um, you can start putting dynamic changes in if you want to, starting it a bit quieter getting louder, depends how much air you've got left, and going vice versa as well. So there's plenty of things you can do um, that will make that exercise um, really beneficial and actually a bit of fun. Um, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, and just incorporate that 10 minutes into your practice routine every day or whenever you practice, and uh, you, might, you might see some benefits. And if not, it's just made you aware of anything that, that might be going on in your, in your mouth or um, with, with your technique. Okay, uh, a 
Bulio 7. I got a high note, which I didn't know I could play. Um, so is that um, like a squeak? Is that an overtone? Or um, is that just a note that you put your fingers on and you manage to get a note out? Let me know. Come back to me. Uh, uh, Tim Miller, do you think that a harder read will lead stability or ability to play the top notes? Um, I play on an, a slightly harder read. I quite like um, the resistance that it gives me. So yeah, when I play higher, they are easier for me to control. Um, but sometimes if you play on a read that's a little bit too hard, you're sacrificing your lower, lower register. Um, personally, just practice tongue position and ear stream. Um, it might be down to that rather than, you don't want to be compensating by going and getting um, a harder read. Because at the end of the day, you don't want um, to be playing your instrument and it to be hard work. You want it to be as easy as it can be. Um, so yeah, just um, have a go with top notes. Like really have a go making sure your ear stream is fast and your tongue position is high before you look at maybe um, going for a higher read, a, um, a harder read. Uh, Soph underscore Osborne, what mouth guard do you use as I have the same problem with my bottom teeth cutting my lip? Um, so I, when I was in music college, because you're playing, um, it's, really, it's a really intense environment to be in, and you're playing five, six hours a day, um, and I just found that my lip was getting, getting cut to pieces. Um, it's not because I'd pinch or anything, it was just kind of, it was just hard work really. Um, so I went to my dentist and he got me just a little bit of, I said what I wanted, um, I said it needed to be really thin um, and just cushion my lip basically. And um, I've had this for about 10 years and it's pretty, pretty, pretty disgusting to be honest with you. But it's basically just a bit of plastic, moldable plastic, like I guess hockey gum shields are made of. Um, I just stick it over my bottom teeth and I can play all day now, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Problem is I can't play without it now, so um, it's a bit of a comfort blanket for me. Um, but yeah, it just, it helps me just play without being in pain, basically. Um, I think I paid about 20 quid uh, 10 years ago. So if, it, if you do have those issues um, and you don't think it's because you're, you're biting or you're pinching um, uh, with your embouchure, then it is something maybe to look at. Uh, uh, let's have a look. Okay, let us move on. So we've got our kind of um, little tips and tricks, our little exercises. How do we incorporate them into music then? Um, for me, when I'm playing um, anything, any, any music, but particularly slow music. For me, that's where you can really explore the, the instrument and you can really explore the different sounds that you can create on an instrument. And for me, in, in a slow movement, in a sonata or a concerto, or even a slow orchestral excerpt, that's where um, tone is highlighted and control and all that kind of stuff. Anyone can play fast, um, but to play with a control um, and, a, and a great sound, I think is a, is a whole other, other, other element to your playing. And, um, if you've incorporated the kind of little tips and tricks that I've, I've said today, um, hopefully playing slow movements will make them sound, sound good. And so I've just got a couple of uh, bits of music today. Um, again, on the old trusty iPad. That I think are really good bits of music. And you can play whatever you want, play something really slow. It doesn't matter what stage of your, um, your clarinet journey you're at. If you're just beginning, that's totally fine. Um, find a grade one piece and play it slower if you want. Um, or if you're at a stage where you're looking to go to music college or you're looking to join the band service, pick something that's a bit more challenging. Um, but yeah, pick, uh, for me, it's about picking the slow movement of something and really trying to focus on tone really trying to focus on um, the lines within the music. Um, and yeah, it just, it just, it's a whole different challenge. Um, so yeah, let's give it a go. So I've decided to choose uh, the second movement of um, the Horowitz Sonatina. If anyone has ever heard of it, uh, it's a fantastic piece. And you're at a stage, um, you know, grade eight, 
plus where you can be playing this type of music. Um, it's a fantastic bit of music, probably one of my favourite pieces to play. And the second movement is absolutely gorgeous. It's in a horrendous key, it's in E major, um, and there's lots of jumps. So going back to um, the previous exercise of 12th practice, they become really apparent in when you start playing slower music, uh, especially music where there are big jumps between octaves um, and you have to slur them. So if I just play, play the first couple of bars, um, I have got a recording of it that I can play along to if you guys don't know it. Um, but yeah, we'll keep it go. And what I'm going to try and do is I'm really going to focus on keeping my tone nice and even. Remembering that I've got to keep a high tone position, I've got to keep my ear stream really fast. Um, yeah, and really work on creating a really, really long line within the music. So I don't want to be stopping on every note kind of thing. I want to make sure that all the notes join into one and we're creating that lovely evenness of sound as we're playing. So we'll give it a go. So it's really slow. It's only about crotchet equals 52 and we're in 3-4. <laughs> and you can hear that I had a bit of a blip going from my D sharp to my B. Um, you might notice that I've got a bit of an issue with um, flat fingers. Um, I'm a bit double jointed in both my little fingers, so for me it's quite a challenge and something that I'm constantly trying to work on uh, to get better at, to get more curves, little fingers. Um, and that was it, that was just um, a bit of an issue there. So if I was going to play that again now, I would is isolate those little bars and really try and make it as smooth as I can. So it was either that my ear stream maybe dropped a bit because I was going down the instrument, or it could be that my tongue had dropped a little bit. Again, subconsciously as we go lower, you might end up dropping um, your tongue position in the ear stream, or it could have been that I just had a bit of a lazy finger. So I'll just isolate that bar and see if I can get it really smooth. on the live stream but for me then that felt a lot better and do you know what even at my stage in, in my kind of musical career musical journey I'm still having to go back over stuff like music isn't something that you just uh, get get to a point and you stop learning it, it's a constant learning learning curve um so yeah for me that was a lot better and then I ended up making a bump on the on the F sharp didn't I so um and that's all I've done is explored a couple of different notes um and it's already highlighted that I need to work on certain little bits in my playing. So if I just play it with the piano, so you can kind of see what it sounds like. I'm not sure if I'm going to be in tune, but we'll give it a go. Fantastic bit of music. If you do get a chance to, um, if, you, if you're looking to buy a bit of music and you're looking for a challenge, definitely look at, at getting the Horowitz Sonatina. It's a gorgeous bit of music anyway, but the, even then I just got goosebumps listening to, listening to that, listening to the, the clarinet player play that. So uh, yeah, just um, really go back to slow movements, really try and focus on um, tongue position, ear stream, all that kind of stuff that we've talked about. 
Um, it might be a bit anal, but it, it's worth doing. It's the way that I practice um, in my practice routines. Um, so really, really be thorough and be be um, be a bit nasty with yourself. Not nasty. Um, that's the wrong word, but. Be a bit critical of yourself. Um, if, you, if, you, if you do get a bit of a bump in a note, go back and do it again. Uh, so, and that works the same then on um, orchestral excerpts. Now, being an orchestral clarinet player, I am not one, but I, I love playing in the orchestra every time there's... I know the double handlers in the band uh, hate it when orchestra comes out, um, but for me, it, it, it's, it's one of the best days when I get to play clarinet and play in an orchestra. Um, and there's a few excerpts that um, if you're going for auditions or anything, um, it's worth looking at. It's worth um, really paying attention to your sounds and, and really honing in those skills. Um, and one of the big ones that comes up quite a lot is, is the second movement in Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. A fantastic symphony. I wish um, Beethoven had been alive when the saxophone was invented, unfortunately died um, long before it. Um, but I get to play Beethoven on the clarinet, which is brilliant. Um, and the second movement um, is in a great key for the clarinet. Anything in F major, I think, on this instrument works really well. It, it helps the, the instrument sing, which is perfect. Um, and yeah, this movement is, is amazing. If you get a chance to listen to the whole symphony, you do. But, and it does have some fantastic um, clarinet solos in it. So the second movement is in 12 8 in F major, all based around the, the clarion, there's nice, nice F major area. Um, it's going over the break a little bit, it's got a couple of Ds in it. Um, but the idea, again, is to get that really good sound, make it sound like you're hitting the person at the back of the room by projecting, um, making sure your tongue position is high and your ear speed is fast. So I'll give you just an idea of what it sounds like. that I really like playing on the instrument. I've got a nice bubble somewhere as well, which is brilliant. Um, yeah, nice key, really, really nice register on the instrument. Um, it's quite challenging in that you really have to play it in time. You're handing over to the oboes at certain points. Um, you're going over, not just, as, as, we, as we're probably away on the instrument, there's not just one break going from the dreaded B flat to B. Um, there's also a break going from C to Z, C sharp, uh, B to C sharp. That's also considered another another break on the instrument. Um, so even though it's it's really slow, it's it's quite a difficult exit to play. Um, you've also kind of exploring scales on the instrument, which is why scales is really important. Um, different dynamic contrasts, and it's only eight bars long, ten bars long, but it's such a challenge. And I would really encourage you guys to um, really go away and. Uh, get an excerpt book um, if you're at that stage in your in your um, clarinet career where you're looking to audition, really get them out, really get the music um, on Spotify or iTunes or other music platforms, whatever you want to use. Um, listen to how the clarinet players play it and then yeah go away and, and try and try and play them basically. Um, yeah, like I said, when you have a good sound, everything else just becomes a bit easier. So you'll be sat in the orchestra playing these lovely clarinet. Uh, solos knowing you've got a great sound and a great technique and uh, yeah it's nothing better than that when it comes to uh, yeah getting the goosebumps at the end of a gig so I think that's about it really um, just a recap uh, to this masterclass um, what I want you guys to do is uh, go away and listen to a wide variety of clarinet players what you like about their sounds um, does a certain player play with a brighter sound that you really like? Do they play with a, a darker, rounder sound? Do you like the fact they use vibrato? Um, remember that we always want 
fast, cold air stream. So remember we want shh, not And we want that tongue position to be relatively high. Slow scales are so important, not just for tone, not just for tone, but just in general anyway. I've been playing, yeah, since I was 12. Um, I've been playing 20 years and I still do slow scales. I still slowly practice everything. I'm quite methodical uh, when it comes to practicing. Um, and that's just the way I get it done. But they are so important. And I, I promise if you just did 10 to 15 minutes a day, um, you'll notice a massive difference. Remember the hashtags, RMBS masterclass, um, hashtag me do it, hashtag, hashtag, look, hashtag yourself doing that um, really slow scale, hashtag yourself doing the falling of the notes, changing your tongue position, practice your twelfths and toe match. And then I want you guys to just, yeah, pick a slow movement and try to make it the best sounding thing you ever have. And like, yeah, once you've got a good sound, everything else just seems to kind of fit in. So we've got any questions before we finish? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, this, this is a good one actually. Kerry Bow, Kerry Bow 1980. I noticed that you use the split F sharp to finish. Does that give you a better tone? Yes, it does. Um, so it's not really a clarinet thing. Um, I certainly don't do it on saxophone because we obviously have uh, keys on the saxophone um, rather than, than holes to cover. Um, but yeah, I actually find that playing this F sharp with the so with the register key, and I also do it for B's as well. Um, for me, it gives a better, better tone. Um, it's not a sh not as um, harsh if you like. So I'll just play a normal one, a uh, normal F sharp. For me, it sounds a bit reedy. It sounds a bit brassy. I don't, I don't really want that in my sound. I don't want that note to stick out. Um, if I play the other F sharp. For me, it sounds a little bit duller, which is what, what I want. Um, so yeah, any chance I can get to use my F sharp, I will. And again, it's a lot of um, practice to be able to do that quite uh, easily. Um, obviously, when we're playing fast, I don't use that. So if I'm playing a D major scale, I will not use um, the four fingering. But yeah, it's a great fingering uh, to use. Uh... Oh, Erica, love the Beethoven. Yes, amazing, amazing, amazing. Alexandra, I'm going to finish my off my degree and then join up. Sounds fantastic. Well done. Um, just to let you know that Pan Corporal Amy Phillips will be on after this masterclass where she'll be able to, um, if you've got any burning questions, if I've missed anything out, um, because you guys have been commenting like crazy and I've not been able to keep up. Um, but yeah, it, um, she'll be coming straight on after I finish this, this live masterclass and she'll be able to answer any questions you might have to do with the job, um, joining process, audition, all that kind of stuff. But yes, fantastic. Get your degree and then uh, when you join up, you can get a master's too. Partially funded, but you can still get a master's for a really, really good, good price. We look forward to seeing you. Uh, a couple more questions. Josie underscore parrot uh, underscore TKD. Hello. Uh, what is a good way to go over the break A to B on the clarinet? Oh, yeah, the dreaded break. Nobody likes the break. Um, again, slow practice, slow, deliberate practice. Um, yeah, just literally playing those notes and making a conscious effort to make sure all your fingers go down at the same time. Don't change anything here. We need to keep the air stream uh, fast and we need to keep the tongue high. So I'll see if I can do it. <laughs> Pressure's on. So yeah, as I was uh, even just doing it that, that slow, and that wasn't that slow, um, I was really having to consciously think, right, I've got to make sure all my fingers go down at the right time. I've got to make sure that I'm keeping my A stream and my tongue position exactly the same, where at least I'm not changing anything. Um, I'm making sure my body stays quite still, because I noticed as soon as my shoulder went up, the, the note bumped. Um, so yeah, it's just really, really slow, deliberate practice around, around that area. Um, and that's all I can say, really. I mean, it, it, it's that thing, isn't it? The break on the old clarinet. 
But uh, the more you practice it, the better you do get at it. I promise you. Uh, and I'll take one more question. Oh, what is the best thing about being in the band service? What a question, Sarah. Uh, Samiakos, is that your name? Apologies if it's not, but Sarah, what a fantastic question. Um, the best thing about being in the band service for me is that I get to play music every day and no two days are the same. One day I can be um, on uh, doing London duties, so I can be stood outside Buckingham Palace. Uh, and the next day I'm sat in concert band working on a clarinet or a saxophone solo. So um, just playing and getting to travel the world and getting to do what I really enjoy doing is, is fantastic. And um, if any of you are thinking of joining, do it. it, it it's a great job. And I promise um, you won't be disappointed when you're in the job. Um, and there was a really good question up here just a second ago that I, that I saw. Oh, who was the second clarinetist you mentioned at the start? Yeah, Jess Wood, uh, 18. It was Corrado Geofredi. Um, unfortunately, I have got him written down, but if I go like this, he'll be back to front. Um, but yeah, Corrado Geofredi. If you just put him into Google, um, he'll pop up. Amazing clarinet player, and he's a, he's a backroom in Dorsey as well, so um, yeah, can, can do anything on the clarinet. Double tongue, triple tongue, circular breathe. Um, he is a machine, but he just makes it look so effortless, and I, I love listening to him play. So yeah, if you, if you get a chance to listen to him, please do. And obviously listen to other players as well. That's me done. I just want to thank you all for listening. Um, as I said, uh, Amy, Band Corporal Amy Phillips will be on straight after I finish this live stream. Um, I really hope you guys take something away from this. Um, it's something, like I said, that I still do in my practice routines, um, uh, especially when I've had a couple of weeks off from playing. Um, so actually being in lockdown is quite good because I'm getting to, getting to get back into that kind of mindset of um, practicing really properly. Um, getting back to the basics but yeah Amy Phillips is, is coming on uh, straight after this live stream and she'll be able to answer you any questions that you might have um, I just want you all to take care stay safe and enjoy practicing <laughs>